We're now very close to the imminent release of one of the most ambitious space games ever released. And meanwhile, whilst we wait for that, Star Citizen is facing a whole set of new troubles. Collectively, these problems may well be presenting the game with a perfect storm. And I think at this point that it's reasonable to suggest that the community sentiment for Star Citizen is now at an all-time low. So why do I want to talk about Star Citizen and all of these issues? Well, firstly, because, well, it's news, so I'd like to let you know what's going on. Secondly, I feel the topic as a whole is very pertinent in the games industry at the moment. Specifically, this year alone, there's been a whole bunch of really, really great gaming titles coming out, and this has been capped by the massive success and massive popularity of the exceptional Baldur's Gate 3. In short, there really is an irony here. Star Citizen began life in 2012, paving the way for a new method of making games. CIG wanted to push back against everything that was wrong with the games industry and produce a new exceptional title that could really highlight what gaming can be. The irony here then is that here in 2023, it's other studios such as Larian Studios which have gone out their way to do this and achieve this. Meanwhile, Star Citizen is looking to be pretty much everything that is wrong with the industry. So let's go through a high-level overview of some of these problems and I'll link resources in the video description where you can find out more information about each of these issues if you so desire. Let's start then with the latest problem. The public test universe, commonly known as the PTU, has been an integral part of Star Citizen's development journey. It's the realm where backers, those who financially supported the game, get an early glimpse into upcoming features, mechanics, and plan a pivotal role in shaping the game's direction through their feedback and basically testing the game. It's a server where all new content is initially released before making its way to the broader public. Historically then, the PTU was open to a broad range of backers. Whether you were a day one supporter or a recent enthusiast, you had a chance of being invited into one of the PTU waves. It meant that you could explore the new content share your insights, as well as test out the content and help with the game's development. However, CIG felt that the way that these waves were structured was not really enabling them to test the game at the best way they possibly can. In short, they felt that testing was a bit too front-loaded, too many people starting up front, and then pittering out over time with less people there when they really needed it. With this in mind, CIG have set about creating a new wave system, this system categorizes players into different waves, with each wave getting access to the PTU at different times. Similar to before, so what's the controversy? Well, it's the fact that the earliest waves, Wave 1 through to Wave 5, get first access in priority and order of how much money that a backer has spent on the game. Although, to be perfectly fair here, that isn't the only criteria. CIG are also going to be inviting players based upon the amount of hours they have spent inside Star Citizen over the past two patch cycles. Now, this part makes a lot of sense. After all, why would you want players into the game who are only going to just appear there for a few minutes, maybe an hour, to test out the new content and then disappear? Instead, it makes far more sense to have the players in who have proven that they will invest time and who are willing to test and try things out. However, it seems that this fact has been overshadowed by the introduction of the monetary side of things as well. Not to mention that there's a lot of people out there who really do love Star Citizen and want to help out, but don't actively spend too much time on it between patch cycles, and these people are out in the cold. So yeah, understandably, this has created a lot of controversy, both from what well, people are generally sceptical against the game to start with, but also from people who are long-time supporters. For example, those who gain access through Wave 1 will be the players who have spent $25,000 on the game so far. Additionally, in Wave 1 will be those subscribers to the game who donate and sub $10 per month to CIG. Now, of course, $10 a month is a lot different to a total of $25,000. But it's a very important point here. Many subscription-based games are not a whole lot more money than $10. So... Are you really getting your money's worth? I guess that depends on how you feel about the game. Either way, it seems many people are letting their feelings be unknown. This shift in structure, this shift in waves for the PTU, has led to a surge of discontent within the community. Many feel that this new approach leans uncomfortably towards a pay-to-test model, where financial contribution trumps dedication and time spent supporting the game. 
and long-term backers, some of whom have been with Star Citizen pretty much since its inception, might not necessarily have spent vast sums of money, and these people quite understandably feel sidelined and undervalued. Another significant concern is the potential narrowing of feedback. Star Citizen's strength has always been in its diverse and passionate community, but by limiting the early stage testing to such a select group, there's a risk that the feedback becomes less varied, potentially missing out on different perspectives and experiences that could be crucial for the game's development. As we journeyed into 2023, back at the beginning of the year, it seemed that this year would have a few potential promises. One particular thing standing on the horizon, not known whether 2023 or a little later, was the Pyro Star System. Announced roughly half a decade ago, the Pyro Star System has become somewhat of a legend within the community. Year after year, it's been dangled like a carrot with promises of its release next year. Yet, as we approach the end of 2023, Pyro remains an elusive dream. This year, the vast universe of Star Citizen has felt, well, stagnant, and I'm certainly not the only one to say that. Many Star Citizen content creators have said the same in their videos, and it's a common theme throughout the uh, forums and Reddit posts pretty much everywhere from the Star Citizen community. So despite the high hopes that were set by Chris Roberts and the high expectations, 2023 has not seen any large-scale content updates. Features like the separate replication layer, the resource system, bounty hunting version 2, and as well as persistent hangars with the freight elevators remain conspicuously absent. All of these were mentioned in the previous letter from the chairman by Chris Roberts as content that they would well plan for 2023. And it doesn't just end there. Players were eager to also experience the player traversal overhaul, the new interaction system, FPS scanning, and the Vulcan graphics API. Yet silence is all that has been received. However, it wasn't all quiet on the development front this year. The long-awaited Persistent Entity Streaming, or PEZ, finally made its debut, and this was some pretty groundbreaking technology that had been long-awaited for. In fact, it was the technology that was needed to build all the future content on top of. Yet its release came with a storm of issues. Fundamental aspects of the game broke down, turning the universe into a playground of glitches and bugs. Whilst a lot of these have now been fixed, many still remain in place. Ultimately then, as we edge in towards the end of 2023, players are still waiting for new adventures and new content. And one can't but wonder, when will the promises of yesteryear become the reality of today? The Banu Merchantman, a name that resonates deeply within the Star Citizen community. A ship of grandeur announced in 2013 as a part of the $27 million stretch goal. By 2014, it was up for concept sale, capturing the imaginations of wallets and eager backers. Fast forward to 2019, and the original concept saw a rework, aligning with the new styles introduced by the Defender. 2021 brought hope. The Merchant Man was revealed to be in production, with a projected work schedule of 50 weeks. Later that year, CitizenCon 2951 provided more insights into its development. Yet by mid-2023, the winds had changed. The Merchant Man was demoted to the development backlog, prioritizing other capital ships like the Polaris from Robert Space Industries. The reasons? Existing design kits for the RSI ships, cost-effectiveness, and the departure of key personnel who had worked on the Merchantman. The Merchantman's unique design and lack of Banu vehicles in the pipeline meant a restart of its development process, casting a shadow of uncertainty over its future. But the Merchant Man isn't alone. Star Citizen boasts 89 different ships or thereabouts, with, as far as I can count, 29 still unreleased. Many of these are large vessels potentially facing challenges similar to the Merchant Man. With only one ship released so far from this backlog in 2023, this really does lead to the question, just how long will backers have to wait for the rest of the ships? For many, the Banu Merchant Man was more than just a ship. It was a dream, a promise of adventures to come, and now its fate, along with many others, remains one of the most poignant chapters in a Star Citizen saga. 2012 marked the beginning of Star Citizen's ambitious journey. 
a journey that has since amassed a staggering amount of nearly three quarters of a billion in funding. In the realms of game development, such a figure is entirely unprecedented, and whilst Star Citizen promises an unparalleled gaming experience, one can't but wonder at what, what point do we say enough is enough. Today, we stand 11 years, or perhaps 12 years, into its development depending on how you're counting. Now, diehard fans I've seen many times before argue that CIG had to construct a studio from the ground up and rework a game engine to boot to fully realise their vision. Of course, these are entirely valid points, yet at some point we got to ask when is enough enough? Where do we draw that line? Is it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years? Is it at 2 billion, 3 billion? Where is that line drawn? Or is there no such line and can this be funded indefinitely and take forever to actually make? It's not a case of not understanding the project, it's a case of living in a reality. So where does that leave a star citizen? Where does it fit into the overall narrative? Well, nearly three quarters of a billion dollars and over a decade in the making, the question isn't just about the game's potential, but also about financial stewardship, priorities, and ultimately delivering on promises. Players are voicing concerns about the game's prolonged development, with some feeling and fearing that it might never see a full release. The sentiment is a mix of hope, scepticism, and frustration. Promises of new star systems, eagerly awaited chips, and gameplay mechanics remain unfulfilled. The question on many's mind, how much longer? Now, Star Citizen isn't just about a persistent universe. Two major components that have garnered significant attention are Theatres of War and a standalone single-player campaign, Squadron 42. Theatres of War promised to blend a Star Citizen space combat with ground warfare, offering an intense objective-based multiplayer experience. The initial buzz, buzz around this was palpable, with players eager to dive into these large-scale battles. Yet as the months rolled on and then the years, the excitement was met with silence. Updates became scarce and the community was left speculating about this particular component's fate. And then there's Squadron 42, the narrative-driven campaign boasting Hollywood talent, promising to be an epic space opera experience. Not only was it just a game, it was a commitment, a promise to backers who believed in Chris Roberts' vision. But then, in a move that raised eyebrows, Squadron 42 was removed from Saul, with no updates, no release date, and a shroud of mystery enveloping its uh, development. Backers are left with more questions than answers. So the silence on these two pivotal components adds to the growing concerns. In a universe as vast as Star Citizen, communication is key, and the community awaits, hoping their voices echo loud enough to be heard. It's a very strange situation for Star Citizen overall. This is just about a small handful of the issues that have plagued the game recently. There's many more that I could touch on, a lot of which I have talked about in the past. I'll link the other videos in the description below and also touch on other sources that I'll list there as well for your perusal. You go check those out if you want to know about more. Meanwhile, I'd love to hear your thoughts and feelings about the entire Star Citizen project. How did you feel about it today? How did you feel about it last year? And how did you feel about it a decade ago? Have your thoughts and feelings on it changed over time? Let me know below. I'd love to hear from you. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys and girls next time.